talk at the final block of talks um, during the sessions of PyCon 2013. Um, our speaker today normally wouldn't need an introduction, but I'm very glad to have the opportunity to introduce him. Um, so please welcome Alex Martelli, who is going to be presenting Good Enough is Good Enough. Everybody can hear me clear? Oh, good. Let's start by checking some cultural assumptions. Who would agree to this uh, uh, feeling? Everybody should always be striving for perfection at all times and therefore setting for a software release that's anywhere below perfect is a regrettable compromise. Who agrees with this feeling? Okay, uh, the alternative being uh, Keep it simple, just good enough, lunch early, lunch often, iteratively improve, enhance, and refactor. Who agrees with this one? Okay, I'm preaching to the choir, great. So you feel free to applaud and woo to the evil perfectionists. Uh, the whole debate uh, has been going around forever, but I'll take my coup from Richard Gabriel. Uh, in 1989, at a LISP conference, uh, uh, to give kind of like a break in a uh, heavy technical talk, he did a little aside about what he called the New Jersey approach versus the worse is better approach, uh, the, sorry, the New Jersey approach, which he named the worse is better approach versus the MIT Stanford approach known as the right thing. You can tell he was completely unbiased, of course, when <laughs> contrasting these two. Um, there followed many years of debate, ensuring that uh, it was Richard Gabriel writing on both sides of the issue, occasionally under the pseudonym uh, Nicky Ben Bourbaki. Uh, I really recommend, it's easy to find all the stuff online, I really recommend you go for it and read it because this person really can see both sides of the issue, at least one at a time, and debate against himself pretty fiercely. Uh, <laughs> but going back to the original concept, he agrees there's four characteristics that both approaches are focusing on, but with different shadings. For worse is better, and his example, of course, was Unix, that's why he called it the New Jersey approach, because Unix was uh, being born at the time, or had just been born in New Jersey, simplicity, especially simplicity of implementation, uh, even more than interface, is the most important consideration in design. Uh, correctness, it's okay, but it's better to be simpler than, than correct. Uh, the level of consistency expected in your project is don't be overly inconsistent. Uh, and the completeness characteristic, while obviously a good thing, it can be sacrificed to any of the other, uh, the other characteristics. And in particular, it must be sacrificed if to, if to make your system more complete, you're threatening its simplicity. Uh, while the MIT approach, or the right thing, has the same for core values, but for simplicity, it focuses on simplicity of interface. For correctness, it has it as an absolute must, the top priority of any software project, with consistency just as important as correctness and completeness roughly as important as simplicity. I believe uh, having uh, knowing, knowing Unix uh, in, in its early stages pretty well and a little bit of ITSS and uh, other systems being developed at MIT uh, at the time, I think this is a simplified but fair enough picture. So why would you ever be willing to do anything but the right thing? Well, Gabriel explains it pretty clearly. The right thing philosophy is based on letting the experts be experts all the way to the end before users ever get their dirty, grubby little hands on your precious system so it can be perfect. Uh, worse is better takes advantage of the natural advantages of incremental development and incremental development satisfies some human needs. Which one sounds more appealing now? 
that they're presented this way. The experts in their ivory towers laving away for years to produce the perfect artifact or satisfying human needs. I believe that well before the question was ever posed, it was answered by G.C. Chesterton. You may know some of his amazing body of work, but his single line quotes weren't too bad either. Anything worth doing is worth doing badly. <laughs> Get it out there in the real world. Uh, a few years after Gabriel, Eric Raymond uh, wasn't actually thinking about the issues Gabriel was raised, but he converged to them in his masterpiece, what I consider his masterpiece, the cathedral and the bazaar, is focusing on two different mental models of software development. Uh, Raymond's cathedral is actually pretty close to Gabriel's right thing. Uh, experts are in charge. They development environment is pretty much sealed off from the external interference and the experts can do their expert thing and make a perfect system. Uh, a bazaar is chaotic. It's a launch and iterate. It's a New Jersey approach uh, to the max. The crowd is in charge of what happens to this piece of software. The, Raymond presented the core bazaar idea in a slightly restrictive way. What he said is, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. I think this applies to choosing and prioritizing features as well, but let's focus on bugs. You may actually not care because your, your code never has any bugs, right? <laughs> well, uh, I was a hardware major in, in university, but still we were supposed to learn some Fortran, just enough Fortran to make ourselves dangerous. And the condition of contest were essentially you got one chance at the punching machine to punch your cards and the pack would be put once into the reader for, uh, for the mainframe and that was it. It either ran or didn't. So you were highly incentivated to get it bug free. And of course, everybody told you it was impossible. Well, as it happens, uh, three freshmen, hardware design majors uh, with uh, this kind of motivation managed to write a Fortran program to compute the conditional probabilities of suit division in the game of Contract Bridge, punched it in, run it once, run perfectly. Now that was the last time in my life any program I ever wrote had no bugs. <laughs> so I wouldn't count on it. Therefore, uh, this may actually give some motivation as to why did what we can now acknowledge as geniuses like Thompson, Ritchie, uh, focus so much on simplicity of implementation? Why was Unix v7, I'm not really familiar with the previous version, so simple in its internals? Because you know, the fewer complications you have, the fewer bugs you're likely to have. Uh, it's, uh, Kernighan put it this way, uh, debugging is twice as difficult as programming in the first place. If you're programming to the level of complexity your mind can contain, you're completely without any hope of ever managing to debug the stuff. Because that would be twice as complicated and you don't have twice as much mind. But a different and also pretty important reflection is that perfection implies big design up front. Inevitably. If you want to only release perfection, you must have designed everything perfectly from the start. Everything must proceed waterfall-like, top-down. Perfect identification of requirements, exactly what problems you are going to be solving begets perfect architecture, begets perfect design, begets perfect implementation. It takes forever and ever. Uh, that's the problem. Why does incremental development, release early, release often, satisfy some important human needs? Because it does actually imply a release so that it can start solving some problems for the users. In uh, the 
idealized perfection model, stakeholders, uh, the people who like to be selling the program if it's commercial or using it in any case, kind of resent the forever part, being held locked out of the ivory tower and not given a say because it's all in the experts' hands. In the real world, requirements change all the time because the real world changes all the time. Therefore, there is no such thing as capturing your program's requirements perfectly. Not forever, not for any length of time. If you are the best requirement extraction expert in the world, you may be doing a great snapshot. As of March 17, 2013, this is exactly what the program should do. But it won't apply next week. So, don't even try. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, waterfall only goes from the top down. The real world doesn't work like that because your design choices feed back up to change the ideal architecture. The implementation techniques that you're using feed back up to modify your design choices. Your implementation always has bugs, except maybe once in your life, and if you waste it when you're a freshman in university, that's it, and for the rest of your life. And some bugs, no matter how well you test, will only be discovered when the rubber hits the road, when your software hits the real world. Which is why iterative development is really the only sensible way to go in the real world. Deploy something, something that solves some problems, some of the time for some users. Fix all the bugs you find, implement some more feature, keep improving, just keep solving user problems and winning mind share. That's part of the problem with the big design up front. Uh, during those uh, seven times seven years in which the experts are holed up in their ivory tower doing their expert thing, what's happening out there? Well, the user's problems are not being solved, not by these experts, so the users turn to something else to solve their problems. They, can't, they won't just uh, lay down and die because their problems can't be solved, and your chance of actually getting mind share, of getting take up by the users, decline the longer you wait to release something that does something for the user because other people are releasing. And by the time your perfect solution hits, probably completely out of date compared to the kind of problems the user have, there may not be that much interest in it because users have already some hackish way to solve some problems uh, that they have. So, in other words, I recommend you think of the verb perfect rather than the adjective perfect. Perfecting your work is great. Just keep doing it. Keep making it closer to your dreams and to your users' needs based on real data about what are the users demanding, requiring, needing. Perfection is a process. It's not a state of things. You never reach perfection. The goalposts keep shifting. There are never any laurels you could be justified in resting on. Just look at what Guido keeps doing with Python. If anything could be said to give uh, their principal architect uh, laurels he could rest on would be Python. But no, even at the keynote today, there he was proposing yet another big thing in the system, all the new asynchronous uh, system. Um, there are a few things uh, you should never skimp on. Let's say some level of lightweight process. Lightweight, not too formal, not too ceremony, Agile, but all the steps that go to make it up, uh, proper revision control, always code reviews, 
never skimp on testing, uh, follow proper uh, release engineering. You need to be able, uh, when somebody reports a bug, to reproduce exactly the same bits this person was running so that you stand a chance to reproduce the bug. And this requires uh, a good revision control system and proper release engineering, tagging exactly what went to make up this particular binary. I would also recommend never to sacrifice on style because, exactly because, you know you will be reworking, refactoring, improving that system forever. Uh, they, any shortcut you might save you five minutes today will cost you five hours uh, in the future, so it's not a good trade-off. Don't skimp on clarity, elegance, and style. And don't skip on documentation, because your chance of actually getting take up by the users decrease horribly if the only way the user can find out to what does the system do again, how does it do it, is dig in your sources. Don't take the fact that you're open source as an excuse to not give a good tutorial, example cases, and a reference. In other words, no cowboy coding, please. It doesn't really save you time. And now just a few examples, very shortly, of uh, the real, uh, of what I see in the real world as the right thing versus uh, worse is better. TCP IP versus ISO OC. Uh, who's here has ever programmed to the TCP IP stack? Almost everybody. Who's here has ever programmed to the ISO OC stack? See what I mean? The ISO OC stack uh, wasn't started too much later than TCP IP, but uh, just didn't have that big, uh, it had some impact in the real world because like the big telecom companies were behind it and so on, but it was just too much the right thing. People say, oh, it was because it was designed by committee. So was TCP IP. There's nothing wrong with design by committee as long as you remember the core principle of TCP IP, rough consensus and running code. Uh, originally uh, written by David Clark, which, as it happens, was exactly part of the MIT crowd that Gabriel was loading for their approach when he uh, and, and a few others started the in Internet Engineering Task Force. He had obviously learned the lesson from worse is better. Another example, have you he ever heard of Xanadu? Several of you have. That was the first big conception of hypertext, unfortunately, it wanted to be the perfect, ideal hypertext. For example, it's absolutely absurd in um, HTML and, and France that uh, links are one way. So that you need a huge machinery like uh, spidering and so on to find out uh, who all is pointing to this page. You do, it's just not a good design. In Xanadu, all links uh, would have been uh, bidirectional and also you could have linked at any fraction of a page and blah, blah, blah. The only problem, it was so focused on being perfect that it never really hit the real world. And meanwhile, a uh, physical chemist uh, in, uh, in Geneva needed something working right now to share scientific paper. And so they built the, the dub, dub, dub. Which one conquered the world? Well, we answer the questions to start with. Uh, an example Gabriel himself brings, uh, uh, interrupted system call. Of course, uh, the user program makes a system call that takes a little time. Uh, it may, something may happen requiring immediate attention, an interrupt or, or signal or call it as you will. And in the MIT uh, AI Labs uh, incompatible time sharing system, every system call needed to be carefully coded in, machine, in assembly too, because that's what they were using, to unwind every state change, resume user mode, and restart from exactly where it had ended to it. That, for some kind of hardware interactions, was really uh, horrible. How did Unix do it? Hey, I'm getting interrupted. I'm setting e inter 
to the global Erno and returning minus one to say, guys, something went wrong. That saved thousands of lines of complex code in every... Of course, the problem is that now the application, who's not responsible for whatever interrupted or signaled the system, needs to redo the call. Big deal. From the application's viewpoint, it turns uh, uh, n equal read something into a, uh, n equals uh, minus 1, while n uh, less than 0, n equals read. And... Uh, if something different from inter happens. Um, a somewhat peculiar analogy to the right uh, thing versus uh, worse is better is in a book on marketing and merchandising, which I strongly recommend uh, to anybody who is saying, what do I care about merchandising? It's not my field. No, but if you care about human psychology, it's still a great read. The Paradox of Chance, uh, Why More is Less, uh, the maximizer uh, customer in this case, that he's talking about consumers, uh, if uh, lives by the motto 99.99% is not 100%, so it's a fail. Uh, the satisficer, 90% uh, is just fine, take it. 80 might be enough, you know, Pareto's law, 20% of effort produces 80% of the results. Uh, it, Pretty good, 80% is not bad at all. That's, uh, guess uh, which kind of uh, consumer is much happier in their lives. I have a mandatory Python example. Uh, they, in this case, uh, the right thing came first, and it's meta classes in all their incredible generality. Uh, 90, uh, let's say Pareto, let's make Pareto happy. 80% of what meta classes can do for you, you can do with 20% of the effort with class decorators. Not going to dwell because you know the thing. Um, Eric Ries, this is a LinkedIn link, uh, but uh, you can buy his book, Lean Startups. Uh, it's controversial, but there's a lot of good stuff there. Uh, defines the concept of minimum viable product, very selfishly, for, from the startup viewpoint. An MVP is a version of a product which allows a team to collect the maximum amount of validated learning with the least effort. So the way he sees the purpose of releasing a product is to learn more about what other product. How should this program be changing? Which is a strange viewpoint, but valid. Because every time your product hits the real world, you learn more. Uh, by the way, I have to point out that Hanson, the 37 Signals guy, disagrees and says, what bother with all these uh, things? Just build something awesome and ship it. That also works. The ship it part is the real heart of the matter. Does this talk try to lower, get you to lower your expectations, be less ambitious? Absolutely not. This is not the point at all. Big, hairy, ambitious goals. If you don't have those, what's, what's a, why bother doing all this stuff? Change the world. As a pretty good writer put it, rightly traced and well ordered. What of that? Speak as they please. What does the mountain care? The point is that the best way to those dreams, the best way to revolutionize the world and make it all better remains release early, release often. Learn from real users' interaction. They are your best teachers. But stay hungry, stay ambitious. But a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? By the way, anybody recognized the source of these quotes? Uh -huh. Browning, one of my favorite poets. Andrea del Sarto is a poem in question, and the quote from Andrea del Sarto that you probably would never recognize is less is more. This is a po uh, painter trying to explain why he didn't like have details in, in a background scene. The only way he finally can express it is less is more. 
I don't, I'm not here to trace and order lines. I'm here to change the world. I'm, I'm here to move your hearts. And for that purpose, details in the background are a distraction, are a negative. Less is more. Uh, and so, let your reach exceed your grasp. And let's move on to Q&A. If there are any questions for Alex, please approach the mic in this uh, aisle over here. Uh, if you're closer to here, you can come up to me and use mine if you like. Uh, first question. Thank you. Um, I really believe in everything you're saying, and in a product space, I think it makes a lot of sense. I work in the services industry, though, where client comes, says we want this ad built, we have to build it in you know X months, and like we don't really have a shot at like doing a first prototype and then improving it. And I was wondering if you had any advice for this kind of philosophy, but as it fits in a services space. Um, services is what I actually end up developing in my uh, daily work, uh, but. Uh, Fortunately, in my case, the potential users of these services are not like sitting half a world away, so uh, the interaction is still very possible, very feasible. And that, I think, is an even more important distinction than service versus product, is how closely can you work with your users. If you can't, then the only uh, almost as good approach is I have. I can suggest is having a product manager or a team, depending how, how huge the project is, of product <laughs> managers that can mind meld with the users and, and like play the user's role and give you continuous feedback from the very earliest prototypes. Whether it's a service or a product, it still pretty much works the same way. Hello. The big fear with um, releasing early and often is that uh, although you have some users who are really passionate and are willing to put up with shortcomings, a uh, vast majority expect perfection. And when they run into trouble, they run away and never come back. How do you mitigate that? Now, not my experience. If uh, they run into trouble because there's no documentation, yes. But if the documentation is there, and it doesn't seem to be working, in my experience, uh, they're usually not reluctant to, to uh, call me if they have my phone number or more likely email or IRC me and say, dude, am I doing something wrong or do you have a bug here? Uh, that's probably because the stuff I do tries to always to be uh, not just another way to solve a problem they could perfectly well solve otherwise, uh, because if that's the point, why am I doing the, the thing at all? It's uh, trying to solve problems that previously they couldn't solve. That's my goal, at least. So they're not that likely to walk away without a fight and go back to having problems that they cannot solve. If they can solve some problems with my software, but it breaks in other spots, they're more likely to complain loudly than to whimper away. I don't know what users, maybe your users are more shy than mine and prefer to uh, go in a corner and cry because their products <laughs> are insolvable. Thinking more about actual products as opposed to open source software. Well, it, it, the fact that the stuff may not be open source is like, is you, are the user paying? Well, then it gets less and less likely than they just walk away without getting body for money, isn't it? Okay. Okay, we have one more question. I guess sort of a follow-up, similar question to that. I see one major product which sort of fits both sides of this argument, you know, is Windows, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of the ultimate user they tested. They certainly didn't wait for perfection before we <laughs> Right. No, exactly. Right? So how do you avoid that problem? I mean, it's the ultimate user tested oh, that's thing, a, right? That's actually a platform, so keeping, it, it, it's a really, really hard point because it's not so much for the end user, they can change the user interface, they have repeatedly over the age generation. The users will always grumble because users always grumble when you 
move their cheese, but uh, uh, we'll adapt because human beings are pretty good. Uh, <coughs> as a programming platform, you have a very different problem. The APIs you're offering had better not shift. I addressed that in a completely different talk. And, uh, APIs, uh, uh, you better be prepared uh, when you release an API to keep supporting it, at least in a legacy mode, for a long time. It's very painful. Yes, that's uh, it's true. It's a Excellent. very difficult, difficult Thank you problem. so much. Um, Yes, so uh, everybody please join me in thanking Alex Martelli for it's been a very enlightening talk.